Story nine of Day and Night Stories by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine An Egyptian Hornet. The word has an angry, malignant sound that brings the idea of attack vividly into the mind. There is a vicious sting about it somewhere. Even a foreigner, ignorant of the meaning, must feel it. A hornet is wicked. It darts and stabs it pierces aiming without provocation for the face and eyes the name suggests a metallic droning of evil wings fierce flight and poisonous assault though black and yellow it sounds scarlet there is blood in it a striped tiger of the air in concentrated form there is no escape if it attacks in egypt an ordinary bee is the size of an english hornet but the egyptian hornet is enormous it is truly monstrous an ominous dying terror it shares that universal quality of the land of the sphinx and pyramids great size it is a formidable insect worse than scorpion or tarantula the rev james milligan meeting one for the first time realized the meaning of another word as well a word he used prolifically in his eloquent sermons devil one morning in april when the heat began to bring the insects out he rose as usual betimes and went across the wide stone corridor to his bath the desert already glared in through the open windows the heat would be afflicting later in the day but at this early hour the cool north wind blew pleasantly down the hotel passages it was sunday and at half-past eight o'clock he would appear to conduct the morning service for the english visitors the floor of the passageway was cold beneath his feet in their thin native slippers of bright yellow he was neither young nor old his salary was comfortable he had a competency of his own without wife or children to absorb it the dry climate had been recommended to him and the big hotel took him in for next to nothing and he was thoroughly pleased with himself for he was a sleek vain pompous well-advertised personality but mean as a rat no worries of any kind were in his mind as carrying sponge and towel scented soap and a bottle of scrubs ammonia he travelled amiably across the deserted shining corridor to the bathroom and nothing went wrong with the rev james milligan until he opened the door and his eye fell upon a dark suspicious-looking object clinging to the window-pane in front of him and even then at first he felt no anxiety or alarm but merely a natural curiosity to know exactly what it was this little clot of an odd-shaped elongated thing that stuck there on the wooden framework six feet before his aquiline nose he went straight up to it to see then stopped dead his heart gave a distinct unclerical leap his lips formed themselves into unregenerate shape he gasped good god what is it for something unholy something wicked as a secret sin stuck there before his eyes in the patch of blazing sunshine he caught his breath for a moment he was unable to move as though the sight half fascinated him then cautiously and very slowly stealthily in fact he withdrew towards the door he had just entered fearful of making the smallest sound he retraced his steps on tiptoe his yellow slippers shuffled his dry sponge fell and bounded till it settled rolling close beneath the horribly attractive object facing him from the safety of the open door with ample space for retreat behind him he paused and stared his entire being focused itself in his eyes it was a hornet that he saw it hung there motionless and threatening between him and the bathroom door and at first he merely exclaimed below his breath good lord it's an egyptian hornet being a man with a reputation for decided action however he soon recovered himself he was well schooled in self-control when people left his church at the beginning of the sermon no muscle of his face betrayed the wounded vanity and annoyance that burned deep in his heart but a hornet sitting directly in his path was a very different matter 
he realized in a flash that he was poorly clothed in a word that he was practically half naked from a distance he examined this intrusion of the devil it was calm and very still it was wonderfully made both before and behind its wings were folded upon its terrible body long sinuous things pointed like temptation barbed as well stuck out of it there was poison and yet grace in its exquisite presentment its shiny black was beautiful and the yellow stripes upon its sleek curved abdomen were like the gleaming ornaments upon some feminine body of the seductive world he preached against almost he saw an abandoned dancer on the stage and then swiftly in his impressionable soul the simile changed and he saw instead more blunt and aggressive forms of destruction the well-filled body tapering to a horrid point reminded him of those perfect engines of death that reduce hundreds to annihilation unawares torpedoes shells projectiles crammed with secret desolating powers its wings its awful quiet head its delicate slim waist its stripes of brilliant saffron all these seemed the concentrated prototype of abominations made cleverly by the brain of man and beautifully painted to disguise their invisible freight of cruel death bah he exclaimed ashamed of his prolific imagination it's only a hornet after all an insect and he contrived a hurried careful plan he aimed a towel at it rolled up into a ball but did not throw it he might miss he remembered that his ankles were unprotected instead he paused again examining the black and yellow object in safe retirement near the door as one day he hoped to watch the world in leisurely retirement in the country it did not move it was fixed and terrible it made no sound its wings were folded not even the black antennae blunt at the tips like clubs showed the least stir or tremble it breathed however he watched the rise and fall of the evil body it breathed air in and out as he himself did the creature he realized had lungs and heart and organs it had a brain its mind was active all this time it knew it was being watched it merely waited any second with a whiz of fury and with perfect accuracy of aim it might dart at him and strike if he threw the towel and missed it certainly would there were other occupants of the corridor however and a sound of steps approaching gave him the decision to act he would lose his bath if he hesitated much longer he felt ashamed of his timidity though pusillanimity was the word thought selected owing to the pulpit vocabulary it was his habit to prefer he went with extreme caution towards the bathroom door passing the point of danger so close that his skin turned hot and cold with one foot gingerly extended he recovered his sponge the hornet did not move a muscle but it had seen him pass it merely waited all dangerous insects had that trick it knew quite well he was inside it knew quite well he must come out a few minutes later it also knew quite well that he was naked once inside the little room he closed the door with exceeding gentleness lest the vibration might stir the fearful insect to attack the bath was already filled and he plunged to his neck with a feeling of comparative security a window into the outside passage he also closed so that nothing could possibly come in and steam soon charged the air and left its blurred deposit on the glass for ten minutes he could enjoy himself and pretend that he was safe for ten minutes he did so he behaved carelessly as though nothing mattered and as though all the courage in the world were his he splashed and soaped and sponged making a lot of reckless noise he got out and dried himself slowly the steam subsided the air grew clearer he put on dressing-gown and slippers and it was time to go out unable to devise any further reason for delay he opened the door softly half an inch peeped out and instantly closed it again with a resounding bang 
he had heard a drone of wings the insect had left its perch and now buzzed upon the floor directly in his path the air seemed full of stings he felt stabs all over him his unprotected portions winced with the expectancy of pain the beast knew he was coming out and was waiting for him in that brief instant he had felt its sting all over him on his unprotected ankles on his back his neck his cheeks in his eyes and on the bald clearing that adorned his anglican head through the closed door he heard the ominous dull murmur of his striped adversary as it beat its angry wings its oiled and wicked sting shot in and out with fury its deft legs worked he saw its tiny waist already writhing with the lust of battle ah that tiny waist a moment's steady nerve and he could have severed that cunning body from the directing brain with one swift well-directed thrust but his nerve had utterly deserted him human motives even in the professedly holy are an involved affair at any time just now in the rev james milligan they were quite inextricably mixed he claims this explanation at any rate in excuse of his abominable subsequent behaviour for exactly at this moment when he had decided to admit cowardice by ringing for the arab servant a step was audible in the corridor outside and courage came with it into his disreputable heart it was the step of the man he cordially disapproved of using the pulpit version of hated and despised he had overstayed his time and the bath was in demand by mr mullins mr mullins invariably followed him at seven thirty it was now a quarter to eight and mr mullins was a wretched drinking man a sot in a flash the plan was conceived and put into execution the temptation of course was of the devil mr milligan hid the motive from himself pretending he hardly recognized it the plan was what men call a dirty trick it was also irresistibly seductive he opened the door stepped boldly nose in the air right over the hideous insect on the floor and fairly pranced into the outer passage the brief transit brought a hundred horrible sensations that the hornet would rise and sting his leg that it would cling to his dressing-gown and stab his spine that he would step upon it and die like achilles of a heel exposed but with these and conquering them was one other stronger emotion that robbed the lesser terrors of their potency that mr mullins would run precisely the same risks five seconds later unprepared he heard the gloating insect buzz and scratch the oilcloth but it was behind him he was safe good morning to you mr mullins he observed with a gracious smile i trust i have not kept you waiting mornin grunted mullins sourly in reply as he passed him with a distinctly hostile and contemptuous air for mullins though depraved was perhaps an honest man abhorring parsons and making no secret of his opinions whence the bitter feeling all men except those very big ones who are supermen have something astonishingly despicable in them the despicable thing in milligan came uppermost now he fairly chuckled he met the snub with a calm forgiving smile and continued his shambling gait with what dignity he could towards his bedroom opposite then he turned his head to see his enemy would meet an infuriated hornet an egyptian hornet and might not notice it he might step on it he might not but he was bound to disturb it and rouse it to attack the chances were enormously on the clerical side and its sting meant death may god forgive me ran subconsciously through his mind and side by side with the repentant prayer ran also a recognition of the tempter's eternal skill i hope the devil it will sting him it happened very quickly the rev james milligan lingered a moment by his door to watch he saw mullins the disgusting mullins step blithely into the bathroom passage he saw him pause shrink back and raise his arm to protect his face he heard him swear out loud what's the damn thing doing here have i really got him again 
and then he heard him laugh a hearty guffawing laugh of genuine relief it's real the moment of revulsion was overwhelming it filled the churchly heart with anguish and bitter disappointment for a space he hated the whole race of men for the instant mr mullins realized that the insect was not a fiery illusion of his disordered nerves he went forward without the smallest hesitation with his towel he knocked down the flying terror then he stooped he gathered up the venomous thing his well-aimed blow had stricken so easily to the floor he advanced with it held at arm's length to the window he tossed it out carelessly the egyptian hornet flew away uninjured and mr mullins the mr mullins who drank gave nothing to the church attended no services hated parsons and proclaimed the fact with enthusiasm this same detestable mr mullins went to his unearned bath without a scratch but first he saw his enemy standing in the doorway across the passage watching him and understood that was the awful part of it mullins would make a story of it and the story would go the round of the hotel the rev james milligan however proved that his reputation for self-control was not undeserved he conducted morning service half an hour later with an expression of peace upon his handsome face he conquered all outward sign of inward spiritual vexation the wicked he consoled himself ever flourish like green bay trees it was notorious that the righteous never have any luck at all that was bad enough but what was worse and the rev james milliken remembered for very long was the superior ease with which mullins had relegated both himself and hornet to the same level of comparative insignificance mullins ignored them both which proved that he felt himself superior infinitely worse than the sting of any hornet in the world he really was superior end of story nine story ten of day and night stories by algernon blackwood this librivox recording is in the public domain story ten by water the night before young larsen left to take up his new appointment in egypt he went to the clairvoyant he neither believed nor disbelieved he felt no interest for he already knew his past and did not wish to know his future just to please me jim the girl pleaded the woman is wonderful before i had been five minutes with her she told me your initials so there must be something in it she read your thought he smiled indulgently even i can do that but the girl was in earnest he yielded and that night at his farewell dinner he came to give his report of the interview the result was meagre and unconvincing money was coming to him he was soon to make a voyage and he would never marry so you see how silly it all is he laughed for they were to be married when his first promotion came he gave the details however making a little story of it in the way he knew she loved but was that all jim the girl asked it looking rather hard into his face aren't you hiding something from me he hesitated a moment then burst out laughing at her clever discernment there was a little more he confessed but you take it all so seriously i he had to tell it then of course the woman had told him a lot of gibberish about friendly and unfriendly elements she said water was unfriendly to me i was to be careful of water or else i should come to harm by it fresh water only he hastened to add seeing that the idea of shipwreck was in her mind drowning the girl asked quickly yes he admitted with reluctance but still laughing she did say drowning though drowning in no ordinary way the girl's face showed uneasiness a moment what does that mean drowning in no ordinary way she asked a catch in her breath but that he could not tell her because he did not know himself he gave therefore the exact words you will drown but will not know you drown it was unwise of him he wished afterwards he had invented a happier report or had kept this detail back 
i'm safe in egypt anyhow he laughed i shall be a clever man if i can find enough water in the desert to do me harm and all the way from trieste to alexandria he remembered the promise she had extracted that he would never once go on the nile unless duty made it imperative for him to do so he kept that promise like the literal faithful soul he was his love was equal to the somewhat quixotic sacrifice it occasionally involved fresh water in egypt there was practically none other and in any case the natrum works where his duty lay had their headquarters some distance out into the desert the river with its banks of welcome refreshing verdure was not even visible months passed quickly and the time for leave came within measurable distance in the long interval luck had played the cards kindly for him vacancies had occurred early promotion seemed likely and his letters were full of plans to bring her out to share a little house of their own his health however had not improved the dryness did not suit him even in this short period his blood had thinned his nervous system deteriorated and contrary to the doctor's prophecy the waterless air had told upon his sleep a damp climate liked him best and once the sun had touched him with its fiery finger his letters made no mention of this he described the life to her the work the sport the pleasant people and his chances of increased pay and early marriage and a week before he sailed he rode out upon a final act of duty to inspect the latest diggings his company were making his course lay some twenty miles into the desert behind el chobac and towards the limestone hills of gubiel hadi and he went alone carrying lunch and tea for it was the weekly holiday of friday and the men were not at work the accident was ordinary enough on his way back in the heat of early afternoon his pony stumbled against a boulder on the treacherous desert film threw him heavily broke the girth bolted before he could seize the reins again and left him stranded some ten or twelve miles from home there was a pain in his knee that made walking difficult a buzzing in his head that troubled sight and made the landscape swim while worse than either his provisions fastened to the saddle had vanished with the frightened pony into those blazing leagues of sand he was alone in the desert beneath the pitiless afternoon sun twelve miles of utterly exhausting country between him and safety under normal conditions he would have covered the distance in four hours reaching home by dark but his knee pained him so that a mile an hour proved the best he could possibly do he reflected a few minutes the wisest course was to sit down and wait till the pony told its obvious story to the stable and help should come and this was what he did for the scorching heat and glare were dangerous they were terrible he was shaken and bewildered by his fall hungry and weak into the bargain and an hour's painful scrambling over the baked and burning little gorges must have speedily caused complete prostration he sat down and rubbed his aching knee it was quite a little adventure yet though he knew the desert might not be lightly trifled with he felt at the moment nothing more than this and the amusing description of it he would give in his letter or intoxicating thought by word of mouth in the heat of the sun he began to feel drowsy a soft torpor crept over him he dozed he fell asleep it was a long dreamless sleep for when he woke at length the sun had just gone down the dusk lay awfully upon the enormous desert and the air was chilly the cold had waked him quickly as though on purpose the red glow faded from the sky the first stars shone it was dark the heavens were deep violet he looked round and realized that his sense of direction had gone entirely great hunger was in him the cold already was bitter as the wind rose but the pain in his knee having eased he got up and walked a little and in a moment lost sight of the spot where he had been lying the shadowy desert swallowed it ah he realized this is not an english field or moor i'm in the desert 
the safe thing to do was to remain exactly where he was only thus could the rescuers find him once he wandered he was done for it was strange the search party had not yet arrived to keep warm however he was compelled to move so he made a little pile of stones to mark the place and walked round and round it in a circle of some dozen yards diameter he limped badly and the hunger gnawed dreadfully but after all the adventure was not so terrible the amusing side of it kept uppermost still though fragile in body his spirit was not unduly timid or imaginative he could last out the night or if the worst came to the worst the next day as well but when he watched the little group of stones he saw that there were dozens of them scores hundreds thousands of these little groups of stones the desert's face of course is thickly strewn with them the original one was lost in the first five minutes so he sat down again but the biting cold and the wind that licked his very skin beneath the light clothing soon forced him up again it was ominous and the night huge and shelterless the shaft of green zodiacal light that hung so strangely in the western sky for hours had faded away the stars were out in their bright thousands no guide was anywhere the wind moaned and puffed among the sandy mounds the vast sheet of desert stretched appallingly upon the world he heard the jackal's cry and with the jackal's cry came suddenly the unwelcome realization that no play was in this adventure any more but that a bleak reality stared at him through the surrounding darkness he faced it at bay he was genuinely lost thought blocked in him i must be calm and think he said aloud his voice woke no echo it was small and dead something gigantic ate it instantly he got up and walked again why did no one come hours had passed the pony had long ago found its stable or had it run madly in another direction altogether he worked out possibilities tightening his belt the cold was searching he never had been never could be warm again the hot sunshine of a few hours ago seemed the merest dream unfamiliar with hardship he knew not what to do but he took his coat and shirt off vigorously rubbing his skin where the dried perspiration of the afternoon still caused clammy shivers swung his arms furiously like a london cabman and quickly dressed again though the wind upon his bare back was fearful he felt warmer a little he lay down exhausted sheltered by an overhanging limestone crag and took snatches of fitful dog sleep while the wind drove overhead and the dry sand pricked his skin one face continually was near him one pair of tender eyes two dear hands smoothed him he smelt the perfume of light brown hair it was all natural enough his whole thought in his misery ran to her in england england where there were soft fresh grass big sheltering trees hemlock and honeysuckle in the hedges while the hard black desert guarded him and consciousness dipped away at little intervals under this dry and pitiless egyptian sky it was perhaps five in the morning when a voice spoke and he started up with a horrid jerk the voice of that clairvoyant woman the sentence died away into the darkness but one word remained water at first he wondered but at once explanation came cause and effect were obvious the clue was physical his body needed water and so the thought came up into his mind he was thirsty this was the moment when fear first really touched him hunger was manageable more or less for a day or two certainly but thirst thirst and the desert were an evil pair that by cumulative suggestion gathering since childhood days brought terror in once in the mind it could not be dislodged in spite of his best efforts the ghastly thing grew passionately because his thirst grew too he had smoked much had eaten spiced things at lunch 
had breathed in alkali with the dry scorched air he searched for a cool flint pebble to put into his burning mouth but found only angular scraps of dusty limestone there were no pebbles here the cold helped a little to counteract but already he knew in himself subconsciously the dread of something that was coming what was it he tried to hide the thought and bury it out of sight the utter futility of his tiny strength against the power of the universe appalled him and then he knew the merciless sun was on the way already rising its return was like the presage of execution to him it came with true horror he watched the marvellous swift dawn break over the sandy sea the eastern sky glowed hurriedly as from crimson fires ridges not noticeable in the starlight turned black in endless series like flat-topped billows of a frozen ocean wide streaks of blue and yellow followed as the sky dropped sheets of faint light upon the wind-eaten cliffs and showed their undersides they did not advance they waited till the sun was up and then they moved they rose and sank they shifted as the sunshine lifted them and the shadows crept away but in an hour there would be no shadows any more there would be no shade the little groups of stones began to dance it was horrible the unbroken huge expanse lay round him warming up twelve hours of blazing hell to come already the monstrous desert glared each bit familiar since each bit was a repetition of the bit before behind on either side it laughed at guidance and direction he rose and walked for miles he walked though how many north south or west he knew not the frantic thing was in him now the fury of the desert he took its pace its endless tireless stride the stride of the burning murderous desert that is waterless he felt it alive a blinding heaving desire in it to reduce him to its conditionless awful dryness he felt yet knowing this was feverish and not to be believed that his own small life lay on its mighty surface a mere dot in space a mere heap of little stones his emotions his fears his hopes his ambitions his love mere bundled group of little unimportant stones that danced with apparent activity for a moment then were merged in the undifferentiated surface underneath he was included in a purpose greater than his own the will made a plucky effort then a night and a day he laughed while his lips cracked smartingly with the stretching of the skin what is it many a chap has lasted days and days yes only he was not of that rare company he was ordinary unaccustomed to privation weak untrained of spirit unacquainted with stern resistance he knew not how to spare himself the desert struck him where it pleased all over it played with him his tongue was swollen the parched throat would not swallow he sank an hour he lay there just wit enough in him to choose the top of a mound where he could be most easily seen he lay two hours three four hours the heat blazed down upon him like a furnace the sky when he opened his eyes once was empty then a speck became visible in the blue expanse and presently another speck they came from nowhere they hovered very high almost out of sight they appeared they disappeared they reappeared nearer and nearer they swung down in sweeping stealthy circles little dancing groups of them miles away but ever drawing closer the vultures he had strained his ears so long for sounds of feet and voices that it seems he could no longer hear at all hearing had ceased within him then came the water dreams with their agonizing torture he heard that heard it running in silvery streams and rivulets across green english meadows it rippled with silvery music he heard it splash he dipped hands and feet and head in it in deep clear pools of generous depth he drank 
with his skin he drank not with mouth and throat alone ice clinked in effervescent sparkling water against a glass he swam and plunged water gushed freely over back and shoulders gallons and gallons of it bathfuls and to spare a flood of gushing crystal cool life-giving liquid and then he stood in a beech wood and felt the streaming deluge of delicious summer rain upon his face heard it drip luxuriantly upon a million thirsty leaves the wet trunks shone the damp moss spread its perfume ferns waved heavily in the moist atmosphere he was soaked to the skin in it a mountain torrent fresh from fields of snow foamed boiling past and the spray fell in a shower upon his cheeks and hair he dived head foremost ah he was up to the neck and she was with him they were under water together he saw her eyes gleaming into his own beneath the copious flood the voice however was not hers you will drown yet you will not know you drown his swollen tongue called out a name but no sound was audible he closed his eyes there came sweet unconsciousness a sound in that instant was audible though it was a voice voices and the thud of animal hoofs upon the sand the specks had vanished from the sky as mysteriously as they came and as though in answer to the sound he made a movement an automatic unconscious movement he did not know he moved and the body uncontrolled lost its precarious balance he rolled but he did not know he rolled slowly over the edge of the sloping mound of sand he turned sideways like a log of wood he slid gradually turning over and over nothing to stop him to the bottom a few feet only and not even steep just steep enough to keep rolling slowly there was a splash but he did not know there was a splash they found him in a pool of water one of these rare pools the desert bedouins mark preciously for their own he had lain within three yards of it for hours he was drowned but he did not know he drowned end of story ten story twelve of day and night stories by algernon blackwood this librivox recording is in the public domain story twelve a bit of wood he found himself in mirren with some cousins who had various slight ailments but being rich and imaginative had gone to a sanatorium to be cured but for its sanatoria mirren might be a cheerful place their ubiquity reminds a healthy man too often that the air is really good being well enough himself except for a few mental worries he went to a guest house in the neighbourhood in the sanatorium his cousins complained bitterly of the food the ignorant sisters the inattentive doctors and the idiotic regulations generally which proves that people should not go to a sanatorium unless they are really ill however they paid heavily for being there so felt that something was being accomplished and were annoyed when he called each day for tea and told them cheerfully how much better they looked which proved again that their ailments were slight and quite curable by the local doctor at home with one of the ailing cousins a rich and pretty girl he believed himself in love it was a three weeks business and he spent his mornings walking in the surrounding hills his mind reflective analytical and ambitious as with a man in love he thought of thousands of things he mooned once for instance he paused beside a rivulet to watch the buttercups dip and asked himself will she be like this when we're married so anxious to be well that she thinks fearfully all the time of getting ill for if so he felt he would be bored he knew himself accurately enough to realize that he never could stand that yet money was a wonderful thing to have and he already thirty-five had little enough am i influenced by her money then he asked himself 
and so went on to ask and wonder about many things besides for he was of a reflective temperament and his father had been a minor poet and doubt crept in he felt a chill he was not much of a man perhaps thin-blooded and unsuccessful rather a dreamer too into the bargain he had a hundred pounds a year of his own and a position in a philanthropic institution due to influence with a nominal salary attached he meant to keep the latter after marriage he would work just the same nobody would ever say that of him and as he sat on the fallen tree beside the rivulet idly knocking stones into the rushing water with his stick he reflected upon those banal truisms that epitomize two-thirds of life the way little unimportant things can change a person's whole existence was the one his thought just now had fastened on his cousin's chill and headache for instance caught at a gloomy picnic on the campagna three weeks before had led to her going into a sanatorium and being advised that her heart was weak that she had a tendency to asthma that gout was in her system and that a treatment of x-rays radium sun baths and light baths violet rays no meat complete rest with big daily fees to experts with european reputations were imperative from the chill sitting a moment too long in the shadow of a forgotten patrician tomb he reflected has come all this all this including his doubts as to whether it was herself or her money that he loved whether he could stand living with her always whether he need really keep his work on after marriage in a word his entire life and future and her own as well all from that tiny chill three weeks ago and he knocked with his stick a little piece of sawn-off board that lay beside the rushing water upon that bit of wood his mind his mood then fastened itself it was triangular a piece of sawn-off wood brown with age and ragged once it had been part of a triumphant hopeful sapling on the mountains then when thirty years of age the men had cut it down the rest of it stood somewhere now at this very moment in the walls of a house this extra bit was cast away as useless it served no purpose anywhere it was slowly rotting in the sun but each tap of the stick he noticed turned it sideways without sending it over the edge into the rushing water it was obstinate it doesn't want to go in he laughed his father's little talent cropping up in him but by jove it shall and he pushed it with his foot but again it stopped stuck endways against a stone he then stooped picked it up and threw it in it plopped and splashed and went scurrying away downhill with the bubbling water even that scrap of useless wood he reflected rising to continue his aimless walk and still idly dreaming even that bit of rubbish may have a purpose and may change the life of some one somewhere and then went strolling through the fragrant pine woods crossing a dozen similar streams and hitting scores of stones and scraps and fir cones as he went till he finally reached his guest house an hour later and found a note from her we shall expect you about three o'clock we thought of going for a drive the others feel so much better it was a revealing touch the way she put it on the others he made his mind up then and there thus tiny things divide the course of life that he could never be happy with such an affected creature he went for that drive sat next to her consuming beauty proposed to her passionately on the way back was accepted before he could change his mind and is now the father of several healthy children and just as much afraid of getting ill or of their getting ill as she was fifteen years before the female of course matures long long before the male he reflected thinking the matter over in his study once and that scrap of wood he idly set in motion out of impulse also went its destined way upon the hurrying water that never dared to stop proud of its new-found motion it bobbed down merrily spinning and turning for a mile or so dancing gaily over sunny meadows 
brushing the dipping buttercups as it passed through vineyards woods and under dusty roads in neat cool gutters and tumbling headlong over little waterfalls until it neared the plain and so finally it came to a wooden trough that led off some of the precious water to a sawmill where bare-armed men did practical and necessary things at the parting of the ways its angles delayed it for a moment undecided which way to take it wobbled and upon that moment's wobbling hung tragic issues issues of life and death unknowing yet assuredly not unknown it chose the trough it swung light-heartedly into the tearing sluice it whirled with the gush of water towards the wheel banged spun trembled caught fast in the side where the cogs just chanced to be and abruptly stopped the wheel at any other spot the pressure of the water must have smashed it into pulp and the wheel have continued as before but it was caught in the one place where the various tensions held it fast immovably it stopped the wheel and so the machinery of the entire mill it jammed like iron the particular angle at which the double-handed saw held by two weary and perspiring men had cut it off a year before just enabled it to fit and wedge itself with irresistible exactitude the pressure of the tearing water combined with the weight of the massive wheel to fix it tight and rigid and in due course a workman it was the foreman of the mill came from his post inside to make investigations he discovered the irritating item that caused the trouble he put his weight in a certain way he strained his hefty muscles he swore and the scrap of wood was easily dislodged he fished the morsel out and tossed it on the bank and spat on it the great wheel started with a mighty groan but it started a fraction of a second before he expected it would start he overbalanced clutching the revolving framework with a frantic effort shouted swore leaped at nothing and fell into the pouring flood in an instant he was turned upside down sucked under drowned he was engaged to be married and had put by a thousand kronen in the tiroler sparbank he was a sober and hard-working man there was a paragraph in the local paper two days later the englishman asking the porter of his gasthaus for something to wrap up a present he was taking to his cousin in the sanatorium used that very issue as he folded its crumpled and recalcitrant sheets with sentimental care upon the precious object his eye fell carelessly upon the paragraph being of an idle and reflective temperament he stopped to read it it was headed unglücksfall and his poetic eye inherited from his foolish rhyming father caught the pretty expression fließendes wasser he read the first few lines some fellow with a picturesque tyrolese name had been drowned beneath a mill-wheel he was popular in the neighbourhood it seemed he had saved some money and was just going to be married it was very sad our reader's sympathy was with him and being of a reflective temperament the englishman thought for a moment while he went on wrapping up the parcel he wondered if the man had really loved the girl whether she too had money and whether they would have had lots of children and been happy ever afterwards and then he hurried out towards the sanatorium i shall be late he reflected such little unimportant things delay one end of story twelve Story fourteen of Day and Night Stories by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story fourteen Transition John Mudbury was on his way home from the shops, his arms full of Christmas presents. It was after six o'clock, and the streets were very crowded. He was an ordinary man, lived in an ordinary suburban flat, with an ordinary wife and four ordinary children he did not think them ordinary but everybody else did he had ordinary presents for each one a cheap blotter for his wife a cheap air-gun for the eldest boy and so forth 
he was over fifty bald in an office decent in mind and habits of uncertain opinions uncertain politics and uncertain religion yet he considered himself a decided positive gentleman quite unaware that the morning newspaper determined his opinions for the day he just lived from day to day physically he was fit enough except for a weak heart which never troubled him and his summer holiday was bad golf while the children bathed and his wife read garvis on the sands like the majority of men he dreamed idly of the past muddled away the present and guessed vaguely after imaginative reading on occasions at the future i'd like to survive all right he said provided it's better than this surveying his wife and children and thinking of his daily toil otherwise and he shrugged his shoulders as a brave man should he went to church regularly but nothing in church convinced him that he did survive just as nothing in church enticed him into hoping that he would on the other hand nothing in life persuaded him that he didn't wouldn't couldn't i'm an evolutionist he loved to say to thoughtful cronies over a glass having never heard that darwinism had been questioned and so he came home gaily happily with his bunch of christmas presents for the wife and little ones stroking himself upon their keen enjoyment and excitement the night before he had taken the wife to see magic at a select london theatre where the intellectuals went and had been extraordinarily stirred he had gone questioningly yet expecting something out of the common it's not musical he warned her nor farce nor comedy so to speak and in answer to her questions as to what the critics had said he had wriggled sighed and put his gaudy necktie straight four times in quick succession for no man in the street with any claim to self-respect could be expected to understand what the critics had said even if he understood the play and john had answered truthfully oh they just said things but the theatre's always full and that's the only test and just now as he crossed the crowded circus to catch his bus it chanced that his mind having glimpsed an advertisement was full of this particular play or rather of the effect it had produced upon him at the time for it had thrilled him inexplicably with its marvellous speculative hint its big audacity its alert and spiritual beauty thought plunged to find something plunged after this bizarre suggestion of a bigger universe after this quasi jocular suggestion that man is not the only then dashed full tilt against a sentence that memory thrust beneath his nose science does not exhaust the universe and at the same time dashed full tilt against destruction of another kind as well how it happened he never exactly knew he saw a monster glaring at him with eyes of blazing fire it was horrible it rushed upon him he dodged another monster met him round the corner both came at him simultaneously he dodged again a leap that might have cleared a hurdle easily but was too late between the pair of them his heart literally in his gullet he was mercilessly caught bones crunched there was a soft sensation icy cold and hot as fire horns and voices roared battering rams he saw and a carapace of iron then dazzling light always face the traffic he remembered with a frantic yell and by some extraordinary luck escaped miraculously on to the opposite pavement there was no doubt about it by the skin of his teeth he had dodged a rather ugly death first he felt for his presence all were safe and then instead of congratulating himself and taking breath he hurried homewards on foot which proved that his mind had lost control a bit thinking only how disappointed the wife and children would have been if if anything had happened another thing he realized oddly enough was that he no longer really loved his wife but only had great affection for her what made him think of that heaven only knows but he did think of it he was an honest man without pretence this came as a discovery somehow 
he turned a moment and saw the crowd gathered about the entangled taxicabs policemen's helmets gleaming in the lights of the shop windows then hurried on again his thoughts full of the joy his presence would give of the scampering children and his wife bless her silly heart eyeing the mysterious parcels and though he never could explain how he presently stood at the door of the jail-like building that contained his flat having walked the whole three miles his thoughts had been so busy and absorbed that he had scarcely noticed the length of weary trudge besides he reflected thinking of the narrow escape i've had a nasty shock it was a damned near thing now i come to think of it he did feel a bit shaky and bewildered yet at the same time he felt extraordinarily jolly and light-hearted he counted his christmas parcels hugged himself in anticipatory joy and let himself in swiftly with his latch-key i'm late he realized but when she sees the brown paper parcels she'll forget to say a word god bless the old faithful soul and he softly used the key a second time and entered his flat on tiptoe in his mind was the master impulse of that afternoon the pleasure these christmas presents would give his wife and children he heard a noise he hung up hat and coat in the pokey vestibule they never called it hall and moved softly towards the parlour door holding the packages behind him only of them he thought not of himself of his family that is not of the packages pushing the door cunningly ajar he peeped in slyly to his amazement the room was full of people he withdrew quickly wondering what it meant a party and without his knowing about it extraordinary keen disappointment came over him but as he stepped back the vestibule he saw was full of people too he was uncommonly surprised yet somehow not surprised at all people were congratulating him there was a perfect mob of them moreover he knew them all vaguely remembered them at least and they knew him isn't it a game laughed someone patting him on the back they haven't the least idea and the speaker it was old john palmer the bookkeeper at the office emphasized the they not the least idea he answered with a smile saying something he didn't understand yet knew was right his face apparently showed the utter bewilderment he felt the shock of the collision had been greater than he realized evidently his mind was wandering possibly only the odd thing was he had never felt so clear-headed in his life ten thousand things grew simple suddenly but how thickly these people pressed upon him and how familiarly my parcels he said joyously pushing his way across the throng these are christmas presents i've brought for them he nodded toward the room i've saved for weeks stopped cigars and billiards and several other good things to buy them good man said palmer with a happy laugh it's the heart that counts mudbury looked at him palmer had said an amazing truth only people would hardly understand and believe him would they eh he asked feeling stuffed and stupid muddled somewhere between two meanings one of which was gorgeous and the other stupid beyond belief if you please mr mudbury step inside they are expecting you said a kindly pompous voice and turning sharply he met the gentle foolish eyes of sir james epiphany a director of the bank where he worked the effect of the voice was instantaneous from long habit they are he smiled from his heart and advanced as from the custom of many years oh how happy and gay he felt his affection for his wife was real romance indeed had gone but he needed her and she needed him and the children milly bill and jean he deeply loved them life was worth living indeed in the room was a crowd but an astounding silence john mudbury looked round him he advanced towards his wife who sat in the corner armchair with milly on her knee a lot of people talked and moved about momentarily the crowd increased he stood in front of them in front of milly and his wife and he spoke holding out his packages it's christmas eve he whispered shyly and i've brought you something something for everybody look he held the packages before their eyes 
of course of course said a voice behind him but you may hold them out like that for a century they'll never see them of course they won't but i love to do the old sweet thing replied john mudbury then wondered with a gasp of stark amazement why he said it i think whispered milly staring round her well what do you think her mother asked sharply you're always thinking something queer i think the child continued dreamily that daddy's already here she paused then added with a child's impossible conviction i'm sure he is i feel him there was an extraordinary laugh sir james epiphany laughed the others the whole crowd of them also turned their heads and smiled but the mother thrusting the child away from her rose up suddenly with a violent start her face had turned to chalk she stretched her arms out into the air before her she gasped and shivered there was an awful anguish in her eyes look repeated john these are the presents that i brought but his voice apparently was soundless and with a spasm of icy pain he remembered that palmer and sir james some years ago had died it's magic he cried but i love you jenny i love you and and i have always been true to you as true as steel we need each other oh can't you see we go on together you and i for ever and ever think interrupted an exquisitely tender voice don't shout they can't hear you now and turning john mudbury met the eyes of everard minturn their president of the year before minturn had gone down with the titanic he dropped his parcels then his heart gave an enormous leap of joy he saw her face the face of his wife look through him but the child gazed straight into his eyes she saw him the next thing he knew was that he heard something tinkling far far away it sounded miles below him inside him he was sounding himself all utterly bewildering like a bell it was a bell milly stooped down and picked the parcels up her face shone with happiness and laughter but a man came in soon after a man with a ridiculous solemn face a pencil and a notebook he wore a dark blue helmet behind him came a string of other men they carried something something he could not see exactly what it was but when he pressed forward through the laughing throng to gaze upon it he dimly made out two eyes a nose a chin a deep red smear and a pair of folded hands upon an overcoat a woman's form fell down upon them then and he heard soft sounds of children weeping strangely and other sounds sounds as of familiar voices laughing laughing gaily they'll join us presently it goes like a flash and turning with great happiness in his heart he saw that sir james had said it holding palmer by the arm as with some natural yet unexpected love of sympathetic friendship come on said palmer smiling like a man who accepts a gift in universal fellowship let's help em they'll never understand still we can always try the entire throng moved up with laughter and amusement it was a moment of hearty genuine life at last delight and joy and peace were everywhere then john mudbury realized the truth that he was dead End of story 14Story 15 of Day and Night Stories by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 15 The Tradition. The noises outside the little flat at first were very disconcerting after living in the country. They made sleep difficult. At the cottage in Sussex, where the family had lived, night brought deep, comfortable silence, unless the wind was high, when the pine trees round the duck pond made a sound like surf, or if the gale was from the southwest, the orchard roared a bit unpleasantly. But in London it was very different. Sleep was easier in the daytime than at night, for after nightfall the rumble of the traffic became spasmodic instead of continuous the motor-horns startled like warnings of alarm 
after comparative silence the furious rushing of a taxicab touched the nerves from dinner till eleven o'clock the streets subsided gradually then came the army from theatres parties and late dinners hurrying home to bed the motor horns during this hour were lively and incessant like bugles of a regiment moving into battle the parents rarely retired until this attack was over if quick about it sleep was possible then before the flying of the night birds an uncertain squadron screamed half the street awake again but these finally disposed of a delightful hush settled down upon the neighbourhood profounder far than any piece of the countryside the deep rumble of the produce wagons coming in to the big london markets from the farms generally about three a m held no disturbing quality but sometimes in the stillness of very early morning when streets were empty and pavements all deserted there was a sound of another kind that was startling and unwelcome for it was ominous it came with a clattering violence that made nerves quiver and forced the heart to pause and listen a strange resonance was in it a volume of sound moreover that was hardly justified by its cause for it was hoofs a horse swept hurrying up the deserted street and was close upon the building in a moment it was audible suddenly no gradual approach from a distance but as though it turned a corner from soft ground that muffled the hoofs on to the echoing hard paving that emphasized the dreadful clatter nor did it die away again when once the house was reached it ceased as abruptly as it came the hoofs did not go away it was the mother who heard them first and drew her husband's attention to their disagreeable quality it is the mail vans dear he answered they go at four a m to catch the early trains into the country she looked up sharply as though something in his tone surprised her but there's no sound of wheels she said and then as he did not reply she added gravely you have heard it too john i can tell i have he said i have heard it twice and they looked at one another searchingly each trying to read the other's mind she did not question him he did not propose writing to complain in a newspaper both understood something that neither of them understood i heard it first she then said softly the night before jack got the fever and as i listened i heard him crying but when i went in to see he was asleep the noise stopped just outside the building there was a shadow in her eyes as she said this and a hush crept in between her words i did not hear it go she said this almost beneath her breath he looked a moment at the ground then coming towards her he took her in his arms and kissed her and she clung very tightly to him sometimes he said in a quiet voice a mounted policeman passes down the street i think it is a horse she answered but whether it was a question or mere corroboration he did not ask for at that moment the doctor arrived and the question of little jack's health became the paramount matter of immediate interest the great man's verdict was uncommonly disquieting all that night they sat up in the sick-room it was strangely still as though by one accord the traffic avoided the house where a little boy hung between life and death the motor horns even had a muffled sound and heavy drays and wagons used the wide streets there were fewer taxicabs about or else they flew by noiselessly yet no straw was down the expense prohibited that and towards morning very early the mother decided to watch alone she had been a trained nurse before her marriage accustomed when she was younger to long vigils you go down dear and get a little sleep she urged in a whisper he's quiet now at five o'clock i'll come for you to take my place you'll fetch me at once he whispered if then hesitated as though breath failed him a moment he stood there staring from her face to the bed if you hear anything he finished she nodded and he went downstairs to his study not to his bedroom he left the door ajar he sat in darkness listening mother he knew was listening too beside the bed his heart was very full for he did not believe the boy could live till morning 
the picture of the room was all the time before his eyes the shaded lamp the table with the medicines the little wasted figure beneath the blankets and mother close beside it listening he sat alert ready to fly upstairs at the smallest cry but no sound broke the stillness the entire neighbourhood was silent all london slept he heard the clock strike three in the dining-room at the end of the corridor it was still enough for that there was not even the heavy rumble of a single produce wagon though usually they passed about this time on their way to smithfield and covent garden markets he waited far too anxious to close his eyes at four o'clock he would go up and relieve her vigil for he knew was the time when life sinks to its lowest ebb then in the middle of his reflections thought stopped dead and it seemed his heart stopped too far away but coming nearer with extraordinary rapidity a sharp clear sound broke out of the surrounding stillness a horse's hoofs at first it was so distant that it might have been almost on the high roads of the country but the amazing speed with which it came closer and the sudden increase of the beating sound was such that by the time he turned his head it seemed to have entered the street outside it was within a hundred yards of the building the next second it was before the very door and something in him blanched he knew a moment's complete paralysis the abrupt cessation of the heavy clatter was strangest of all it came like lightning it struck it paused it did not go away again yet the sound of it was still beating in his ears as he dashed upstairs three steps at a time it seemed in the house as well on the stairs behind him in the little passageway inside the very bedroom it was an appalling sound yet he entered a room that was quiet orderly and calm it was silent beside the bed his wife sat holding jack's hand and stroking it she was soothing him her face was very peaceful no sound but her gentle whisper was audible he controlled himself by a tremendous effort but his face betrayed his consternation and distress hush she said beneath her breath he's sleeping much more calmly now the crisis bless god is over i do believe i dared not leave him he saw in a moment that she was right and an untenable relief passed over him he sat down beside her very cold yet perspiring with heat you heard he asked after a pause nothing she replied quickly except his pitiful wild words when the delirium was on him it's past it's lasted but a moment or i'd have called you he stared closely into her tired eyes and his words he asked in a whisper whereupon she told him quietly that the little chap had sat up with wide-opened eyes and talked excitedly about a great great horse he heard but that was not coming for him he laughed and said he would not go with it because he was not ready yet some scrap of talk he had overheard from us she added when we discussed the traffic once but you heard nothing he repeated almost impatiently no she had heard nothing after all then he had dozed a moment in his chair four weeks later jack entirely convalescent was playing a restricted game of hide-and-seek with his sister in the flat it was really a forbidden joy owing to noise and risk of breakages but he had unusual privileges after his grave illness it was dusk the lamps in the street were being lit quietly remember your mother's resting in her room were the father's orders she had just returned from a week by the sea recuperating from the strain of nursing for so many nights the traffic rolled and boomed along the streets below jack do come on and hide it's your turn i hid last but the boy was standing spellbound by the window staring hard at something on the pavement sybil called and tugged in vain tears threatened jack would not budge he declared he saw something oh you're always seeing something i wish you'd go and hide it's only because you can't think of a good place really look he cried in a voice of wonder and as he said it his father rose quickly from his chair before the fire 
look the child repeated with delight and excitement it's a great big horse and it's perfectly white all over his sister joined him at the window where where oh i can't see it oh do show me their father was standing close behind them now i heard it he was whispering but so low the children did not notice him his face was the color of chalk straight in front of our door stupid can't you see it oh i do wish it had come for me it's such a beauty and he clapped his hands with pleasure and excitement quick quick it's going away again but while the children stood half squabbling by the window their father leaned over a sofa in the adjoining room above a figure whose heart in sleep had quietly stopped its beating the great white horse had come but this time he had not only heard its wonderful arrival he had also heard it go it seemed he heard the awful hoofs beat down the sky far far away and very swiftly dying into silence finally up among the stars end of story fifteen end of day and night stories by algernon blackwood